Turn on the mic, please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, work session items. The only thing we have on the uh, work session is the uh, budget workshop. At this time, uh, public comments on work session related items uh, will be received. Please limit to five minutes. So, is anyone in attendance? Yes, sir. Uh, please step forward. State your name and address. My name is Howard Turk. Excuse my voice, I just had a new plate put in. <laughs> but anyhow, I live at 152 Quincy Street. I've been there since I was 20 years old, and I'm 75 now. So I've been there for 55 years. And I've been after all the way back from Chester Gosheski to get that street straightened out. Nobody, every city manager, I even came up and seen Thad last year, talked to him. Same thing. All the sand that came out of North Side, millions, none of it was spent there. Now, all the gas and not oil, but gas revenue there is being used on everything but street. So every one of you must have went down Quincy Street. It's only one street long, but it's got holes in it. There's no other street like it. It's bad. And after 55 years, don't you think one of the city council people would come forward and say, hey, let's do it. He's waited long enough. A few years ago, excuse me, about 10 years ago, uh, Cynthia Fuller, Fuller was my councilman and the mayor. She came over there, looked at it. There was a section 20 foot wide by about 50 foot long. There was nothing, nothing to repair. It was just dirt. She got a hold of Mitch, told him, you will do it. From that time on, me and Mitch didn't get along. One day, I was here in the office meeting with somebody else, Denise, and he walked in, and I turned up to him and I says, oh, we're going to get Quincy Street now? He grabbed me by the throat and choked me. I turned and looked at uh, Denise and surprise. This can't go on. I don't know if that's the reason why he got kicked out of here or what, but after 55 years, don't you think Northside, Quincy Street needs to be repaired? Before, when Garber was on, it was only 85,000. Now it's up to about 120, 140,000. Please, each one of you think for yourselves, and we got to get that done before I done. Thank you very much. Do we have anyone else that wishes to make public comment? We'll begin with the work session then. I, when we left off last time, uh, Council Member Beaton wanted to uh, have a discussion on streets. So, that where we want to head first? That's where, that's where Let's 
I'm looking at the street projects okay. and capital uh, improvement plan. Okay, page. Please. I'm getting to it. All right. Um, starts on, starts on page, page 18. 19 of the capital improvement. <coughs> Okay, the breakdown of where we're spending the 383 700 is what I'm looking for. The breakdown of where it's being spent. That's on page 20. Pardon me? Page 20. I've got it up on the screen. Oh, okay. <clears throat> okay. It looks like we're doing some work on 6th Avenue, short. Uh, <coughs> Fifth Avenue, Jefferson, and Washington. Is that correct? Is Jeff here? The list is up on the screen of the ones that are proposed. Right, but I want to. I'm, I'm just asking about the north side <clears throat> um, at this point. So that would just be Sixth Avenue short, Fillmore. <laughs> Uh, Washington and Fifth Avenue in Jefferson, and we're doing a mill and fill. It says heavy rehab mill and fill, right? Correct. Okay. <clears throat> um, that's for this year in this budget, but it won't be done this spring. It'll be done, say, next spring? Potentially, it could be done yet this fall or next spring, depending on um, how fast we can get the corings done and the engineering can be completed and uh, if we can get favorable bids yet this fall it could be done yet in 2017 it may be spring, and we have to yeah match cash flow also okay um, then nothing is really scheduled for the north side uh, in 2019 and then in 2020 We've got Jackson, Van Buren, Cleveland, a little bit more Washington and Jackson. And that's reconstruction with storm, right? Correct. Isn't that kind of the category that uh, Quincy falls into? It is. Um, and this, the, those two projects, are, there's actually three streets that are there that would be reconstructed, but that's the first year that we'd have available to put money into utilities. And below Jackson and Van Buren, we've got undersized mains. Um, it's one of the lowest pressures of water. And from the fire department's perspective, it also has the highest um, fire, load. fire loading. It's got the highest, highest fire loading because of the, um, the lumber yard. Um, we've also had numerous uh, freeze ups and run waters in that area. So um, that was selected as a priority to match up uh, work on local streets, but also improvements on the infrastructure below them. But that would be a, that would be similar to what needs to be done in Quincy, right? Same type of category, yes. Okay, then in 2021, we've got <coughs> four Fifth Avenue, St. Mary's. Uh, That's not what you're showing up on the screen. 2021, I'm looking at 2021. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, that's also, well, that's heavy re rehab, mill and fill. Um, and then by 2022, we've got local reconstruct with storm sewer project to be determined. <coughs> and you've got 750 feet, I think that's what that means, 750 feet. Yes. That you could do. Would Quincy fall into that category? It could. Um, the reason why we've got reconstruct with, with storm sewer at that point is um, whatever project that ended up being would also have utility work below it. And that far out, um, typically we don't like to, to, it's difficult to try to project out more than three or four years on specific candidates because priorities change. Uh, we're, we learn more about the utilities below them. Um, 
So we put that as a placeholder, um, but we hadn't selected a, a specific candidate yet. Well, it occurs to me when I'm, I'm trying to find it in, in last year's um, budget under capital improvement, we had Quincy listed, I believe. Uh, and I'm looking right now frantically because I lost my place. Ed's going to look to see also. It wasn't in the capital improvement plan no, last no, year. I mean, I think it was in, it was mentioned in the uh, report that we did from the street ad hoc committee, I think is where that showed up. Yes, that's, that's where it was scheduled in 2019. I remember that, I didn't bring that report. But yeah, thank you. Okay, here's the problem. We, we've kind of, we've known about it. We've, we've made some tentative plans for it, but it never gets done. Uh, to Mr. Turk's comments, I feel his pain. Uh, and I know there's a lot of bad streets out there. But if you can either swap some of these projects to do Quincy earlier, or at the very minimum, put Quincy in where it says to be determined, and then stick to it, I, that street's a mess. I, it's not. It's not a lot of fun to drive on it um, if you have to to have business down there for some reason. So it's been, of course, it's it's been a just a catalyst of unhappiness in that whole area. And I just think it's really wrong for us to keep ignoring one of the the most vocal groups of people have been on Quincy. Well, from, from the public works and the, the engineering perspective, um, we, are, we have a very robust asset management plan for streets. The asset management plan for streets is written for the best management practices, which is to do the, <coughs> the least cost effective treatments on streets. The most cost effective. The most cost effective, the least costly treatments on streets um, first, keep your good streets for or keep your good streets good. And that's kind of what we're doing with the six miles of of paving that we're doing in two weeks. Those are not the worst streets in Manistee, but we can do six miles for the cost that we could do a couple blocks of reconstruction, and we can preserve those for another decade. Um, so the asset management is keep your best assets in the best condition you can, and then as money allows, fix the worst ones. So. Um, that's very difficult from a public perspective because that tends to leave the worst streets in the worst condition until there's enough funding available for them. Um, and that's the, the human side of it that I think we have. I understand the economics and I understand the scientific evaluation. And actually, Jeff, I think you've done a pretty good job managing all of this. But there's this human element too. And there's, it's, it's really painful. Um, for people to live in a street that's that serious of a condition. And I know we have others like it, but these, these folks have really tried. They've brought this to our attention, they've written about it, they're on social media. They have really con tried to convince us, and I'm actually speaking more to the council members. Streets was the one thing that several of us, Roger and I know uh, Mr. Smith, you know, that was one of our main focal points, myself, for getting elected, was to do something about streets. And I think we really owe the public, even if it seems a little bit less economic, but if we can move Quincy ahead, I think we should do that. I understand your point completely. The other, the other criteria that we look at um, is not just the asset management, but it's also <laughs> managing the assets of the utilities below them. And when Quincy Street, uh, came up, it was probably eight, nine years ago, um, when I had any involvement with it. Um, estimates were done, we looked at the infrastructure, there's some sanitary sewer repairs that need to be made, there's some storm sewer that needs to be completed, and that road can't just be uh, milled and filled, it, it's got a poor base, because we've, we've uh, cored that base, it's gonna be completely reconstructed and, and realigned. So then it falls into another category of uh, we've got to be able to afford the utility work below that. 
And from our perspective, it's trying to look at the assets that are most valuable and most critical on the water and sewer. Um, and that's what we've been putting before you. Now, I, I, I would agree. I think it's the council's job to then balance out if there's something else in the community that has a higher priority because of that. Um, certainly that's where we need to hear and that can change. From us, it's data driven. Okay, for 2022, it still says to be determined. Mm -hmm. At the very least, I would, I'm asking council members to at least change that to say Quincy. And if something works out so that we can do it earlier, fine. But I think we at least have to have it in there as a goal. And I'm, I'm requesting that we have that change made. So we're not really changing numbers, but we're changing, we're identifying a project that needs to be done. I don't have a problem with that. Um, it's been a long time coming. I lived on Quincy Street for seven years. And, uh, it was in better shape then, back in the Cleveland, Cleveland um, sorry, 95 through 2002. Um, but to that point, um, Cleveland will have to reconstruct that street too, coming around that meets Quincy Street. Yeah, because that that is definitely like driving on the moon. It would be done um, at the same time. Okay, all right, and I I would go with that. If that's council's consensus, we can make that change. I would agree. I agree. Okay. It's bad. No, I, th I think it's imperative. We we went through. Uh, an ad hoc street committee plan, and there were recommendations that were made. Um, and I, I think if we're ever in the future to consider a millage, which was one of the things that, that was proposed in there, the first thing we have to do is preserve the sources of funding and be consistent in funding from the general fund, from the capital improvement fund, and in other sources. Because too many times when you do something like that, as soon as you get a millage, the people say, well, that takes care of it. We don't have to fund it from these other sources again. And I think we need to keep dedicated to the process that we're going to put money and invest in, in streets. And that we're also going to coordinate this with the utility work that needs to be done. Uh, but there's it, just absolutely no logic in something going for, uh, for a very extended period of time and deteriorating to the point to where it's unsafe or, or marginally usable. And, and yet, continuing to rehab good streets on top of that. Now, I understand the logic and, and cost savings because two years ago, uh, Mayor Pro Tim Zelensky and I attended a work session in Travis City for the Municipal League that went through that process. So what was a mill and fill and what was a microsurface and, and the economy of, of maintaining and, and crop sealing. Uh, we do need to keep the pressure on that. I see the funding is fairly constant as we move forward um, until 2019, and, and then the capital improvement money drops off significantly uh, for that year. Uh, we're not dealing with that budget yet, but we also look forward and see what's going on in the future. I just want to make sure that we stay consistent to see we're coming up this year in supplemental funding from, uh, from what we did last year. <coughs> People, people do need to know when they're going to get their streets repaired. So how many years out were you putting that? Quite a few. 22. 22. I mean, I'd love to see it in, in, in 2020 in, in Switch Jackson and, and Van Buren around. So that road, but, I'm just trying to make this clear in my head. That road is so bad, there's absolutely nothing that can be done. I mean, do, do we... Does, you can't put chips and tar down like some places. Some cities will tar and chip a road, a small block or something, to make it last a little bit longer. It's pretty you, can, you can certainly do an overlay. You can do all kinds of things to it. But but if you just did a, a simple overlay on it, because the base is bad, um, it will deteriorate very rapidly, and it, it's not a wise investment of the money. If, if you're going to fix the road, I would fix it right and reconstruct it. The, the base is, is very inconsistent and very thin underneath it. So um, I, I don't know if you recall, but do you know how many years ago MDOT repaved Veterans Memorial Drive? 
probably eight years ago, seven. Before when they were working on the bridge. When they did the detour on the bridge, they did a mill and fill on that. Beautiful road, got a brand new road out of it. But if you drive it right now, it's all alligator cracked like it's 30 years old because they didn't fix the base when they put it on there. So it was a very temporary uh, good asset for us, but right now it needs to be reconstructed again. Well, I'll probably look at this every year, and, and if we can move it up, I'll probably be asking for it. I just want to get it in place. I mean, we just have to have something. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate anything that we could do to either move it up or at least put it somewhere permanently in place. Next subject. <laughs> motor pool. We're not talk about the motor pool. Last year, um, I brought up the fact that 61% of the expenses last year for the motor pool were for debt service for equipment that had already been purchased. And here we go again this year, uh, about $600,000 in purchases and half of that to be financed. Um, we have a fund balance in the motor pool, and, and I understand the cash flow aspect of that fund balance uh, in, in the motor pool. Uh, what are we doing to try and minimize the amount of finance items in a motor pool? I mean, the backer was supposed to, is to have two years left on its lease, uh, and now we want to replace the backer this year. Am I reading something wrong there? Possibly. Um, you know, I think there's a couple of questions there. So the, the Vactor um, had a five-year balloon. Mm -hmm. So what we've done with the Vactor, at least in my tenure, is it's basically we buy it with a guaranteed buyback, and it becomes more or less a perpetual lease. So it's basically like you're renting the, the equipment, so you always have that critical piece of equipment fresh and new, and you don't have huge maintenance expenses on it. So what the budget proposes is that that piece of equipment that we have now to turn back in at the guarantee buyback and then we acquire a new one and do that same thing over again. That's how that's been done in the past. Um, just to be clear, there are some pieces of equipment that are financed, but whether we finance it or we pay for it in cash, the vast majority of those payments are going to be paid to the vendor anyway. There's actually very little that's paid in interest because we've gotten pretty good, pretty favorable interest rates. And I don't have enough money in the motor pool, we don't have enough money in the motor pool to do all cash purchases um, for the size of the fleet we have. This motor pool, even when it was at its peak, which is probably now, actually, it's funded at 550000 um, First of all, it was almost immediately drawn down a couple hundreds of hundred thousand dollars to buy some equipment because the fleet was in really bad shape at the time. But even at 550000 you'd have to have a motor pool of almost twice that much um, to be able to kind of self-fund everything and not have to finance everything. We don't have the assets or the sort of resources to do that. So what we do is we take every piece of equipment, we look at their lives, we look at the miles, we look at the hours, and we kind of schedule out when we think that's going to need to be replaced. Um, that's subject to constant revision based on the mechanic and, and other, other items, but we schedule that out for a 10-year period and kind of see if we can make the numbers work. Um, even, even doing that, um, we still run into some problems where we have uh, bubbles of, of equipment that needs to be replaced roughly at the same time. And we're doing our best to try to even that out, but it's an ongoing process. Um, I can't manage the motor pool, and Jeff can't manage the motor pool by buying everything in cash. There's just no way to do it. Um, we have to, at times you have to finance that equipment in order to make the cash flow work. So that's that's how we've structured it, that's how we've set it up um, in this year's budget, and how we've done that in the past. But what's the purpose of the motor pool fund? I, I mean, uh, just, just a basic question. I mean, if we don't fund it adequately from the departments that get equipment from it, why even have it? Why not just make it a general fund item? Well, and that's been discussed before. It, it was set up through an ordinance to help fund and be a rotating fund to fund equipment. <coughs> but since day one, it's never been funded adequately to replace the size of the fleet. So if, if council wants to reprioritize its spending and increase the contributions to the motor pool, they can certainly do that, but they're going to have to cut spending elsewhere in order to make that happen because there isn't enough money. We try to increase the contributions as the budget allows to the motor pool by some kind of an inflationary factor each year, but the equipment also goes up, you know, with inflation. So we're trying to get ahead, but that's something we can't do, you know, in one or two years. It's got to be done over a multi-year effort. 
Um, but, but the answer to your question is, if you, if you wanted to change the ordinance and dissolve the motor pool and transfer those funds and just kind of do it as a pay as you go, you can, but this motor pool allows you to have it visible and kind of see where it is and it's a little easier for us to budget for it. And it allows for continuity within the general water and sewer funds because those contributions aren't fluctuating okay. all over the place. We but use it, the motor pool fund balance a little bit to absorb those fluctuations so we don't unduly disrupt services in either the general fund or the water and sewer but it doesn't give you a true budget, budget picture of the departments that are using the fund. It, it, it certainly doesn't, no, because some of those, some of those, but it probably the, the proportion between the water and sewer utility and the general fund is, is roughly proportional to, to what the department is. You know, we haven't gone through the, the detailed calculation to do that, but it's roughly proportionate. But neither one of them is, is funded high enough, again, to, to fund the size of the fleet we have. And you have to realize some of those pieces of equipment aren't specifically attached to the water and sewer fund or specifically attached to the, um, to the general fund. They float back and forth between those. And you introduce that dynamic and you have to track that. And at some point, all that tracking really doesn't make a lot of sense for the end result. Do you questions about this guys? I am, I'd like to, uh, just listening to, to everything and trying to digest it, it sounds to me like we're we're actually living beyond our means, and we use this fund to to live within our means. Does that make any sense? Um, uh, it, it's a revolving fund. We we have the fleet size that we have to provide the service levels that we that we have, and that's constantly been being evaluated. Um, the short answer is yes, we're, if the motor pool is to be self-sufficient and we're and we to, uh, to receive enough rent payments each year to adequately fund the purchases of the fleet over a period of time, whether we finance or not, there's not enough money coming in. So from that perspective, the motor pool isn't self-sufficient, but it's been going on for 20 years and we've managed the fleet by either extending the life of equipment or downsizing the fleet or buying different pieces of equipment. So. It's been successful for 20 years, so from that perspective, it is sustaining. You know, doing projections, it may run into some problems, but we always make the proper adjustments for that. So, um, it's just one of those items that, that you know, if it, it works fairly well the way it is, there may be some challenges, but I think at that point, we adjust the fleet size, or we extend the life of the equipment out, or we do what we need to do to make it work. I think it installs some discipline in the process as well. And, and to me, the biggest thing is that it does is it, it provides for budget stability, particularly for the general fund. Well, I, I think it needs some discipline also. And I have watched the, the gas fund, the gas and oil fund, get more get leveraged to the point that there's no more to leverage. I've heard you sit here and say that we need to change that. And then right to the point where you said we can't do anymore, we've used it all. Then we tap into this fund, and now we're starting to do the same thing. And this, I've repeated this. I'm just repeating what I've said before. Where do we go when this fund is gone, and how long can we continue to, to operate like this? Council Member Zelensky, I don't think this fund will be gone because it'll be managed to not do that. And if you look at what the projected fund balance in, for is going to be, it's the highest it's been in my tenure here. So that shows discipline, I think, on the, on the, on the part of the city when it's purchasing equipment and extending it out. Now that fund balance is going to get drawn down over the next several years and we're going to have to look at that and manage it and continue to evaluate it. But I don't think we're in a critical position in the motor pool at this point. Okay, the three um, police interceptors, wants or needs? Based on, on the history of how we've done that and their miles, we've rotated those cars out every four years. I can't speak to whether it's a want or a need directly. That's one of the things I've asked uh, Chief Kozel to take a look at and give you his opinion on the vehicle, so that'll be forthcoming. Okay. So those are just cars, right? That I right. understand. Okay. Police cars. Does this price include fully equipped and ready to go, or is this uh, is this just the police cars themselves? No, the the, the estimated um, cost was to be all inclusive, including all the equipment and swapping out things. More decks, small amount, but is that is that for 
I, when I think of a mower deck, I think of the something that attaches to the to the lawnmower. Is that right? Yeah, we've got uh, those two are particular for two uh, pretty old John Deere tractors that we have. Most of the, most of those are used down by the beaches. Um, I think we actually had it scheduled out to replace the mowers, but the mechanic and the parks uh, lead men believe that we can keep those mowers running pretty effectively. They're in good shape, but the mower decks, because of all the sand down at the beach areas, are just eaten through, and we've welded and patched and done all we can do, and we just need to buy new ne new decks for them. Do we utilize Michigan Deals when we buy mowers or buy decks? Uh, the last mowers that we bought, we did. We used my deals. Uh, I'm not sure if the decks are eligible for that, but we'll certainly research it when we're looking at it. What kind of condition is the plow trucks in? Uh, we've got 10 plow trucks. Um, generally, they're in, in pretty good condition. Uh, we've got two that are still uh, over 20 years old and uh, are well beyond their replacement life. And as Ed said, so we've got 10 plow trucks and as opposed to buying three in one year and having to spend a half million dollars, what we're trying to do is get those on a uh, once every two year replacement schedule. Um, by doing that though, I've had to delay a couple of the trucks and uh, the one that uh, we would have replaced just blew a transmission on it, and it's a that's a five six thousand dollar repair item. Um, but because it's got the new transition, we'll drive that and get a few years out of it. Um, but even if even that truck with a new transmission on it, if I tried to trade it or sell it, I could probably only get two to three grand out of it. Um, so at some point, the the maintenance cost of them are just so high they break down every time we use them. Um, 20 years is way too much. We're trying to get those the life of those down into the the 16 year, uh, but but then again we've got to spread them out. Ten trucks every two once every two years is is a 20 year life. Is this are the the plow truck that you're talking about, Jeff? Is that fully equipped? It would need thousand. Yeah, it would be uh, the cabin chassis plus the dump box and the underbody scraper and. All Just the all the kind of like what we have today, the, the new models? Almost, well, we just bought two, uh, we took delivery of two at the same time. One of them uh, was a salter and the other one was a dump body. This would be another dump body. Okay. Just like we that. just bought one the year before that too, didn't we? Uh, we've bought three in the past four years. Okay. But buy? it's a little it's a little confusing because when we receive them is not necessarily when we purchase them. Uh, we, we ran into, uh, with the harsh winters we had three and four years ago, there was an 18 to 24 month delay on, on getting equipment to build the trucks. So there was two of them that got grouped together and we took delivery at the same time last year. And I, and I understand they have about a 15 year lifespan? That's what's recommended by the, all the dealers, the mechanics. Um, I think that the, the, the dump trucks like this one I think we can extend that out to 20 because most of that is hauling. It's not the heavy, hard plowing. Um, when you get into the, the actual four plow trucks, the single axle uh, trucks that we use, then I, then I think you're, you're right on in the 15 to 16 year life because uh, they, they just, their duty is just different. When we look at this vector um, and the lease and the balloon payment, um, and all these factors. And the company's going to buy this thing back at a guaranteed price. They're going to refurbish it and they're going to sell it to someone else. Correct. Do we ever look at buying something other than brand new equipment, reconditioned equipment, and equipment that may be more cost effective? I've had those conversations with the vendors. Um, typically, so I don't remember what the guaranteed buyback was on this one. Do you? It was 160, 180,000. Somewhere around 180,000 was a guaranteed buyback. Um, they they replace a lot of the wear parts in it and then refurbish it. Um, they put about 80 to 100 thousand dollars into it. Probably end up reselling it for 250 to 300 thousand. Um, and they typically sell them to smaller communities or they put them in a uh, their rental fleet um, and rent them back out. Um, I've asked if that's something that we could just take the machine that we've got and refurbish it, but um, it doesn't completely re, reju rejuvenate the machine back to brand new. Um, and 
they've analyzed the way that we use it, all the, the jobs that we use it for, um, and that's not something that they've recommended. What is, uh, on the new truck, Jeff, on the factor, what type of service agreement or warranty do we have on those when, when we get a new vehicle? I would have to look that up to give you a specific answer, um, but I believe it's a one-year warranty. One year. Yeah. And, and the, this truck, when we were under that, that year warranty, um, we had a uh, blower that went bad, and it was a $45,000 repair to it. But that was, I got that covered under warranty. If you check, please. Well, I'm sorry. On the recondition, let's say you did go that route. Is there any, you know, if there's any coverage on those? I don't remember what the what the coverage was on a, on a leased one or no, on, a re, on, on a refurbished on, one. On refurbished, yeah. Yeah, I'd have to ask that question specifically. Be, I'd be curious to see that. If you lease one, it, it, have, you, have you checked into leasing and, and what, what um, the difference would be? Is it cheaper? Is it more? Is it? We have uh, we have not looked at leasing on the Vactor because we took delivery of this one uh, just about the time that I came on board. We have looked at every other, uh, like the loaders. Uh, we've looked at leasing of, of the street sweeper. Um, and the terms, the terms are not as favorable as an outright purchase, and especially when you've got a guaranteed buyback, um, like we had on the on the sweepers, kind of a, sim, so a similar thing. Do we also use Michigan deals for the Vactor and then their program? I will tell you everything that I purchase that I can get through through my deals, okay. um, unless I can. Well, we always check my deals, but then we also check other local vendors. And sometimes we can, sometimes we'll sneak out even a better deal that way, but we're always looking for the best price on them. What's the sewer service truck? What, what, what is Well, um, we've got one pickup truck that, um, I don't remember the year of it. You don't have those listed in here, do you? Um, we've got one truck that's, that's ready to go. And so we were looking at um, how best to we know which one's got to go, but then if we buy a new one, um, you know, where do we put that? And so the concept that we came up with was that the Parks Department uh, believes that they can be more efficient by carrying, by adding some toolboxes to the, one of their current pickup trucks. So when they're doing service on all the restrooms, playground equipment, they don't have to keep running back and forth. Um, what they needed was actually exactly what our current sewer <coughs> service truck has and what the sewer service truck, um, what they need is something a little bit different. And so what we're going to do, or what we propose to do, is to buy a different uh, truck for the sewer service and then slide their current one to the parks. And then the current parks truck that that would replace would replace the truck 117 that's, that's at, at the end of its useful life. So we're, we're, every time every time we propose one of these, we're trying to trying to make each of the departments, each of the uses, as efficient as we can. Last last year in in the budget was uh, maintenance tracking software. Mm -hmm. Did we ever buy that software? What's that? Did we ever buy that software? Well, we bought the diagnos the diagnostic um, equipment, um, and it's it's very different. What we purchased is very different. The technology had improved a lot, so it's it's a tablet that's able to plug into the uh, vehicles and get all the readouts. Um, a lot of that software is now included, so there was specific software that we were going to purchase, um, and we don't need to do that at this point. So um, the savings on that just rolls right back into the, the motor pool fund balance. Okay, because you know, it, it, last couple of vehicles that, that we purchased, the uh, people come in with a list of uh, 10, 12, 14, things that are wrong with the vehicle and, and I'm kind of a proponent of when, when something needs to be fixed on a vehicle, fix it. Don't let things continue to, to build up uh, and become a, a major operational hazard or a safety factor. What, what are we doing to make sure that we're on top of, of our game when it comes to maintaining this big fleet of vehicles we've got? Out well, there? you asked that of me last time and I have, I have not put that together. I believe the police and fire have done that for the last police vehicle and the fire pickup truck. Um, I know that when those vehicles need some work, they bring them down 
in the mechanics of it gets parts and works on them. Um, the stuff the stuff in the public works. Um, each time there's an issue, the guys are there to, to fix them and keep them up. That said, um, and you asked the question about the, the, the police interceptors, um, I specifically, when we were putting putting this plan together, specifically asked the mechanic his opinion on, on the current vehicles. And um, he said that they're, they're at that point of their life where the wear and tear is going to get very expensive and we're going to start replacing engines and um, putting more money into the vehicles uh, than, than really what it's worth and, it, and that's efficient. And one of the things that, that one of the other guys asked was, well, how many miles are on those vehicles? And I think it, the one in particular was 110,000 miles. But with the equipment that you just asked about, um, Jeremy actually plugged in and found out that the hours on that engine were far, far exceeded what the normal mileage would be at 110 hours and was able to do some calculations. And, and it's actually, the wear on the engine is triple what an engine that, that was driven 110 miles would be. So um, he's being very, very, uh, I think he's being very intelligent in how he looks and forms those opinions. Do we have an in-house mechanic for the the police cars? Do they go to your mechanic or does that go out? Anything that we can do in-house, we do in-house. Anything that's very specific or if it's a warranty item, they go back to the manufacturer or the dealership to work on them. Um, if it's something that we, we're not capable of, then we'll outsource that. But whenever we can do it in-house, we do it in-house. What sort of aftermarket is there for these cars? I do not know on the police cars. I, the pickup trucks that we've been selling or trading in, uh, the aftermarket spent about $1,000. Um, we, I, I, we had offers of $1,000 for the last uh, two salt trucks, three salt trucks, at the time that we purchased the new ones, I thought that was absolutely silly. So we held out, we put them in the public auction. Um, it was seen by 200, 300 uh, people across the state and even out of state. And what we found is um, because these were 22, 23 years old, nobody wants a truck that's over you know, 16, 18 years old. Um, and we ended up selling one for a little over 2,000, one for 1,600. And, one for a thousand dollars because they're just they're just used for parts. One of the uh, police cruisers had to get an engine changed, didn't it? Yes. Do you, you know how long ago that was? You guys, wouldn't know. Um, I believe it was last fall, late last fall. Well, my experience, we patrol 3.2 miles here. In my experience in Clare County, which is a very large county. I've seen Ford interceptors go anywhere from 250 to 300,000 miles. Sometimes they don't shut off for days. The engine runs. It all depends on the maintenance and how well you upkeep them, how long they'll last, how long you keep, keep the upkeep going. Nobody ever drove an unsafe vehicle. They were always maintained and safe. It was my responsibility to make sure that they were safe. I would never let anybody take a vehicle out that wasn't safe, and nor would I expect anybody to that wasn't safe and fully capable of doing the job. But somehow, we've got to figure out a way that we spread these purchases out rather than buy them all at once. I would like to see them spread out more, um, a year apart, something, just so we're not continually taking this, this hit all the time. Um, we bought the Explorer last year. We went three cruises this year. <laughs> I'm not sure where the, the mileage and, and such is for the, <coughs> the detective's vehicle. Um, you know, it, at some point in time, we do need to spread it out. I, I agree with what you're saying, Roger. I think that's something that we have to take a look at um, with the mileage. I think a lot of things are different nowadays with the use and what's inside the vehicle. The undercarriage, the hours that they're staying there on, on the vehicle with it continually running, as you well know. I think we have to take a look at trying to pace that out over maybe once a year. It's tough is that right now knowing our fleet is almost at the same age with the same miles, the same issues with engines. We just replaced a water pump at a cost of $1,600 on one of our rides. Do we have to take a look at that? I know that I've also reached out to uh, look at some fund matching 
you know, it's at minimal, but at least something that we could do to try to help out. That's something we'll be looking into also to try to offset some of the costs. However, with our fleet right now and the needs that we have, we have to try to stay status quo with that revolving amount of cars to replace. If we can try to do that within the next fiscal year to try to plan out, then we'll do that, try to look at a better way to manage how we're utilizing our cars, and we'll do that to try to get more extended use out of the cars. If we could spread that out, and then if something come up, we, we can always go to contingency fund and, and take care of that need. Oh, and I, and I, I don't want to, anybody to think that I would want anybody to drive anything that was not 100% safe and that I wouldn't drive myself at 120 miles an hour if I had to. Right. And I've done that. And I, I, I want to make sure that you understand that. I want everything to be kept up. I don't want to see that laundry list of things that are bad. I want them fixed because I think they need to be safe. I think, I think across the board, I think all the council members want to make sure that everyone that is operating a vehicle and performing a function for the city of Manistee has safe, reliable equipment to operate. Uh, they won't keep people from asking questions and trying to seek an economical end to do something. Uh, and, and I think that's where we come in and do our due, due diligence and the budget process to make sure that we are getting the best value for the dollars that, uh, that the taxpayers are giving to us. But safety uh, and functionality is, is important. You know, broken down plow truck sitting in a garage is, is not plowing streets. Uh, a broken down dump truck is not hauling snow off of River Street and getting the job done. So, you know, I can fully appreciate that. And but I am committed to funding those services that the people uh, really appreciate that, that are being performed here in the city. So. And the maintenance that they're doing that I've seen, I mean, I've only been here for seven days, is, is exponential. It's to be able to reach out to them, get the vehicles there, get them looked at, trying to get the opinion. Are we going to be able to do it ourselves in-house, um, get the parts? It's, it's, it's been uh, well taken advantage of. If it's outside their scope, as Jeff was saying, we'll take it elsewhere. But I think that is something you got to remember in, in our line of work, this not only getting us from point A to point B, this is our office. You know, this is what we do every day. Is That's our mobile office that we're always you know, having to utilize. So it's a little bit different in scopes. And I understand that. We used to set the police vehicles up, um, especially the take-home vehicles, to to meet the needs of that particular person. Everybody kind of liked their mic in a, a different place. and uh, So we would. it was our office. They spent a lot of time there. Yes. Um, and, and I understand that. But I also understand there needs to be continuity too, so that whoever drives the vehicle, they everything's in the same place. But electronics and everything have changed so much. And, um, I, I've kind of lost track, except what I read now on the internet. But electronics change almost daily for for police vehicles. Uh, yes, and the it, biggest thing is the wear and tear on on the pole with that electrical, with your NVRs, with your in-car cameras, with everything you have nowadays. Is the, the difference that you have. You probably wouldn't know yet, but I, I remember at one time we used. They used to be able to, and I know where I was worked over in Clare, that we were able to do reports right from the vehicle. Are we capable of doing that? Does anybody know? I can tell you that there is a capability to do that, and I believe that it's been visited here with uh, the police officer group. But I can also tell you that in today's day and age, for a police officer to sit in a vacant lot and do the reports, your mentality of your safety is of most. And it's different than it was back when I was policing in the early 90s when you felt a little more comfortable. <clears throat> yes, this is man Steve, but you don't know what's going to happen. It's very hard for an officer to sit out in the open because you don't know what's going to happen. And you don't have that safety net of people around you. So I understand what you're saying, but sometimes it's difficult. I want to put my back up against a wall. I want to have a wall to my left. I want to have a wall to my right. I like to have an alarm in front of me so I know someone's going to be approaching my car. Yeah, I understand. So. I still sit with my back to the wall when I go to the restaurant. But I'm just saying it's a little, it's a little bit different, the, the safety aspect, and that's, it's difficult for officers just to sit in those areas where we should be, you know, because you're always thinking. And it's hard for you to be sitting there and just typing away and you're, you're focused. We like to have that because our officers out there in the, on the streets, don't get me wrong. Visibility. Yeah. Yes. Looking for a way to try to spread it out, and I understand, and, and that's something that we have to examine and take a look at. And I'm certain that we'll be uh, having something that we can try to do to, to the benefit of the city. I look at it as as a benefit, also. Then you keep up with technology, and things change, and you you're rotating new stuff in. And, I agree. Yeah. Any other questions on motor pool vehicle?
next subject. I want to talk about vehicle allowances, mileage allowances. I noticed the budget's got, I know part of the contract for the city manager includes an allowance for vehicles, but also planning commission and our building maintenance. And, you know, I had asked Mr. Saylor earlier whether or not the allowances paid to people uh, for those vehicles included uh, benefit costs or retirement costs um, and such. And the answer to that would be? The, the vehicle allowances are included in the definition of final, final average compensation for purposes of retirement. But the, the impact of your FAC, um, most of them are FAC 5, is fairly minimal based on the, the amount that they're getting for allowances. And for the facility manager, um, that really, we call it a vehicle allowance, but it's really a tool allowance. He uses all of his own tools to do the work here for the city. The city doesn't provide him with any tools. And he drives around uh, with his vehicle. So it's primarily for tools and a little bit for mileage. Okay. And we're using all his equipment. But it does, it, it, we are assessed retirement cost and, and benefit cost <coughs> against that allowance. Certain benefits, just mostly MERS, isn't it? it it's figured in for the, for the MERS FAC. Um, off the top of my head, I have to double check whether it's subject to FICA. I just I don't know without looking. <coughs> One of us is, is trying to suppress a sneeze, so and the other one is coughing. That's the only thing that's going on. What? I said one of us is trying to suppress a sneeze, and the other one is coughing. That's the only thing okay. that's going on. I, have, I did just want to ask a general question about um, motor pool allowances. Um, in some cases, we, we get, we, not motor pool allowances, I'm sorry, um, car allowances, we, we allow so much. Per, per month or per pay period for a car allowance? Is that how that works, so much a month? Right. Okay. Um, why do we choose to do that rather than either, I think we have a vehicle, what, or, or pay mileage for people who don't use it very, very often? Well, number one, that vehicle is not always available. Good example is tomorrow. Denise has to be in Lansing for a conference, and Cindy has to be in Traverse City for a conference. So there's only one vehicle, so if somebody has to take their own personal vehicle, then the city reimburses them for mileage. So we do reimburse for mileage when that vehicle is being used, and it's right. Okay. But if they travel outside of a 50 mile radius, the vehicle allowance doesn't cover that anyhow. But the, the vehicle allowance, by policy, is if you get a vehicle allowance, you know, if if you're traveling within the county, you don't get mileage. If you have to go outside the county, that's when you would get mileage. In addition to the allowance. Exactly. If you weren't in the city vehicle. Exactly. So have we ever done a comparison to see how many miles a person will travel at on the average a year and what we pay them a year not and not how they since, how that not since I've been here. But we do uh, emphasize the employees that if our vehicle is available, we'll use that. That's the number one priority. And, and furthermore, the policy calls for if the vehicle is available and you choose to take your own car, you don't get paid mileage. We'll reimburse you for gas because we're going to be paying for the gas anyway, but we don't pay you mileage. You know, I would like to make a statement about the budget. I, I've learned over the course of several years that the budget process and what, what's in the budget uh, that it becomes wanted to prove by city council uh, consent of council. And there's a lot of detail in several hundred pages of, of the budget document. So we don't get a lot of time to, uh, to, to interact as, as a council once the budget's released to ask some questions and get some clarification. And I know we want to do that in a public forum and stuff. I don't, don't want people to get the feeling that I'm picking on them or I'm picking on a, a, a particular department or, or nitpicking something. Because this, this is our opportunity before 
we vote on a budget and approve it uh, to approve all the elements in here. It, by city charter, one of the things the council does is set compensation. There are compensation changes in the budget that, I mean, you have to go through it pretty thoroughly, read the budget to see what, what those are. They're not necessarily all highlighted. I'm not disagreeing with those compensation changes, and I know some of those are driven by union contracts uh, in, uh, in, in certain cost of living aspect. One of the things I'm curious about is that we're taking a big increase this year in health benefits. I understand about 18%. 19% roughly. 19. And we also have a significant increase in our merits contributions this year. Where, where's that money coming from to take care of those? In terms of the health care, number one, we're looking at other options. Okay. For that, not only with the current uh, broker that we have, but we're also in discussions with another broker for uh, other opportunities. Uh, with our current broker and nine uh, other <coughs> staff, we've met with them several times to look at what other options that we have. And uh, once we get the, the final options, we're going to be meeting with the, with the employee groups to find out how we're going to be able to do this. The so city's not going to be able to equal. 19% increase. Not. So we're going to have to look at the cost here. Okay. I understand there are provisions in some of the uh, union agreements that allows us to reopen with certain uh, thresholds met uh, in the negotiation process. But, but say we we got those increased personnel costs this year. Is that coming from some other area? Is that coming out of the general fund? Is that coming from departments? Where Where is the increased revenue coming from? Any of the departments that operate under the general fund, that's where the funding comes from. It's mm -hmm. from the general fund. And it's a matter of how you uh, work the numbers to, to come up and cover those costs. But right now, we've, we've I think I'm correct in saying the budget is the worst case scenario on the up here. Yeah, the, the, budget, the budget presumes that um, that 19.4% or whatever it was um, is split between the employee and the city for our cost sharing formula. Um, and and it's, a, it's been able to absorb that. Obviously, neither the city nor the employees are going to want to eat that much of an increase. For, for a typical family, it's going to be over $1,400 a year. Employees aren't going to want to do that. Two of the contracts have a mandatory reopen if they increase 16 to 7%. So we're working on compiling the data and getting the numbers together. We'll go back and talk with all the groups and hopefully find a plan that maybe is more affordable, maybe has higher deductibles, higher co-insurance. There's a lot of different ways to skin that cat. Um, and hopefully we can come out with something that's affordable for the employees and also saves the city some money from what we have budgeted in here. That would be the I'm just curious about the health insurance. Are you just sticking with Blue Cross and looking for different programs within Blue Cross, or are you looking at Priority Health as well? We did get a bid from Priority Health that was higher than what Blue Cross was. So we're working right. up in Blue Cross right now. And we've looked at Blue Cross, the traditional Blue Cross Blue Shield products as well as Blue Care Network and Priority. I, I will say um, part of what's driving the increase, according to, to our consultant and broker, is that um, there used to be three groups that Blue Cross rated on. We were in the mid-sized group. They've condensed those to two. And by the groups that have gone through that process have all had rather large increases. Um, the, our our, our uh, broker had a 67% increase on their own insurance. And they had several municipal groups that had 50% you know, increases. So obviously nobody can live with those. Uh, but we're doing the best we can within the confines and, and sharing the costs as best we can. And, uh, I, th I think based on some preliminary um, back of the envelope benchmarking, just in conversation with some of my peers in other communities, um, our plan is um, pretty good, in fact, it, it, from the perspective that we, we put quite a bit of the cost on the employees. Um, we have pretty high deductibles. You know, it's not like we have a really, really rich plan compared to a lot of the, the other communities that I've looked at. But nonetheless, we've got to make sure that it's affordable for both the employees and particularly for the city. And that's the process we're going through right now. We, we looked at this in late 2015, very early 2016 when I came here. I was familiar with a um, provider that I used in another community that had substantial savings. We had him come up take a look at what we had, and he couldn't save us any money. So we had it evaluated then, and now we're working with another 
broker to see if there's some opportunities there. This particular broker that we're uh, looking at has a little stronger presence with priority health that we might be able to take some advantage of. So you know, I just want council to know that we continually look at it and we just don't accept what they tell us. We, we look at other options. I know, I was just curious if having recently made an insurance change and priority health was better. So that's why I asked the question. Yeah. We were hoping we might get a, uh, a little bit better bit, bit from priority health, but it didn't work out. I like, I like your explanation of what you do because I feel we, we do the same thing <coughs> up here in, in relationship to city staff. You know, just it, it, don't take it for granted. You know, always looking for, for an alternative and pushing, you know, and, it, and I think that's working together to do that and, and it's not meant to be offensive right. or well, intrusive. Yeah, the one thing I, I can assure council is that we're very frugal with the money that's entrusted to our care. You know, one of the things that, that I say is, you know, it's, it's not our money, it's the community's money and we have to spend that wisely. So our department has try to get the best value for the dollars that they have. They know it's not an unending supply. So I'm very comfortable in the, the work that our staff does in trying to maximize the dollars that we're entrusted with. Okay. Uh, personnel, yeah. I, would, I would like um, a, a rehash of the uh, public works request for full-time personnel. Jeff? <coughs> A little slow, Jeff, so bring me up to speed one more time. This past year, the legislature uh, passed a new law that reimbursed communities that operated movable bridges and allowed them to be uh, reimbursed their operational expenses through Act 51 funds for the cost of operating those bridges. I believe there's 26 in the state of Michigan. 21 uh, bridges though, right? Or both 26 bridges. 26 bridges in the state of Michigan. There's two movable bridges in, in the city of Manistee. MDOT owns and operates one bridge and contracts the city to do the, op the actual operation of it. The other bridge, which is Maple Street, is owned and operated by the city. So historically, all the cost for maintenance and operation and capital improvements has been paid for by the, by the city, and street funds have been used to fund that. So uh, for every $10,000 that it, we have to put into that bridge, that's $10,000 that's not going into other street work, snow plowing, paving, uh, cleaning, that sort of thing. So when the bill was passed, uh, we waited to see how they wrote the, the, basically the program that followed the law. And then we were invited to attend meetings at MDOT um, up at the regional office up in Gaylord, and we attended those. The average operational cost for a movable bridge in the, in the state of Michigan is between $220,000 and $230,000 a year. The city over the past decade or two has tried to reduce those operational expenses on Maple Street Bridge down as far as we can go but still maintain uh, the legal limits of what's required by the Coast Guard, um, at least basically the Coast Guard, to keep the navigable waterway uh, open to vessel traffic. Um, we specifically asked them at that point if, because we didn't want to be penalized on the reimbursement because of, we had reduced our efficiencies down to such a degree. And, uh, and I followed up with them two different times, but they basically uh, said that whatever operational costs we have to operate that bridge is reimbursable. And I've already got the paperwork, uh, but I have not filled it out because I, we need to wait until this budget process is completed. Um, so all of our operational expenses will be reimbursed through the state of Michigan. Currently we hire three seasonal employees to operate the bridge uh, May through the end of October. 
the cost of those uh, operations are would be reimbursed by the state is if we kept it status quo. Um, we decided to that cost thirty thousand the thirty thousand dollars that would be thirty thousand dollars for today. the seasonal employees currently that we're paying. Correct. Okay. We decided to explore to see if this was an opportunity for the city to benefit beyond just the straight reimbursement. And what we put together was a concept of using union employees to operate the bridge as opposed to seasonal employees. The first benefit of having union employees operate the bridge is the ability for those employees to do uh, a lot of the, the regular maintenance on the bridge while they're working, to be able to operate the bridge consistently, uh, to maintain the training. Um, I don't know, to be honest with you, I don't know what the dollar value of that bridge is, 30, 50 million dollars. I mean, it's a, it is a huge, expensive, complicated piece of equipment. Um, so the, the, the first benefit is having trained uh, employees on that bridge. The second thing that we looked at was obviously one half of the cost, one half of the annual cost of those employees would be reimbursed because the bridge operates six months out of the year. The state would fully reimburse us for all of their payroll um, and benefit packages, the full cost of those employees for those six months. It would not pay for the six months uh, November through April that they're not on the bridge. So uh, we looked to see if, if this could leverage uh, additional opportunity for, for the public works. What we've proposed in the budget is essentially uh, we have a, a, an employee, a 41-year employee in the public works that's retiring next week. We would propose not to replace that employee in the current position that they're in, but we would shift that to the bridge. and. It, in order to make up for that during the, the summer period, we would add one additional summer employee. And then we would, we proposed hiring two new union employees that would make the complement of three bridge tenders for Maple Street Bridge. And I mean, we can walk through how all those numbers uh, calculate out. Um, but we went through, Ed and I went through probably uh, six, eight different uh, iterations of this. But we believe that, uh, or what we've proposed is, by putting union employees on that bridge, um, we can cover the all the out-of-pocket costs for it. It still nets the city a $7,000 savings over what we're getting today. And essentially, I get two employees during the shoulder months uh, of, of November through April to assist in other public works uh, work that we do. The benefit of that to me is uh, that's usually the time when, when our guys are using up a lot of their vacation. Um, I think it gives us more flexibility in scheduling uh, winter maintenance and snow plowing, which potentially could, could reduce over time. I wouldn't commit to that, honestly, because we just don't know how the winters are going to play out, but it gives us more ability to handle that and absorb it. Um, the, the period right now, March and April, for us is a is a critical period, trying to get everything cleaned up, trying to get the parks cleaned up, trying to get everything opened, because right now we lose three employees that go to to Memorial Bridge on May 1st. So this is our time to really get things uh, off and running and, and get as much stuff done as we can. Um, my, my difficulty in understanding this is, is I, as I see status quo, is, is it costs us $30,000 a year with three seasonal employees to operate the bridge. Currently, That's yes. Current, right? Mm -hmm. The new revenue slash cost avoided, uh, $143,500, is, is that what it's going to cost us for the two full-time employees, or, or what, what, what exactly does that label mean? Can you define the label? Sure. So the, the $143,500 is the MDOT reimbursement of $106,500, which is the two FTEs for half of a, or three FTEs, excuse me, for half of the year. So that, that's what MDOT's going to reimburse us yeah. over and above what we're doing now. They haven't been reimbursing they us in the past, have they? 
Okay. So that's all new revenue, the 106, 500. Okay. We're going to save 30 grand by not hiring the seasonal employee. So that's okay. 30 grand that we're, and then the 67,000 is a landscaping contract that the city had that we would eliminate and be able to absorb with the staffing. So that's what that would be, 43, 500. Okay, we're still going to have a seasonal employee though, right? Correct. But mm -hmm. that's figured in up at the top where it says additional seasonal employee, 6400 $6,400. <coughs> And I looked at these numbers and projected them out five years, at, um, and I used just for quick, quick calculation a 5% inflation rate on the cost of the full-time employees. Overall, 5% on wages and benefits. And we still are a net benefit in cost, um, not quite as much as what's there. And the reason for that is is because we're getting reimbursed partially for an employee that we are already carrying. And so that when you carry that out, even at an inflated factor, we're still positive. I think that the important, what, what this proposal does is mirrors what we currently are doing with MDOT on the US 31 bridge. Okay. US 31 contracts the city to operate that bridge. So those three employees for six months out of the year are 100% paid for by the state of Michigan. The benefit to the city is that the period of time where we need the most employees is in is in that winter period, and so we get we get three additional employees over the winter time because of the Memorial Bridge, but it only costs the, the community half the cost of those employees because we only use those half the time. Three more employees or two more employees? Well, I'm talking about the 31 bridge. Okay. Currently, MDOT pays for th those three employees for six year six months out of the year. Okay. That was before the law was enacted. With the, when the law was enacted, then it allowed the reimbursement of the operational expenses on the city-owned bridge as well. Okay. Now, when we, when we put the numbers together and just looking at hiring three new employees, there was a net cost to the community, and we didn't want to do that. So we tried to structure this so that we hired two, re reassigned one of our current employees, backfilled that with a seasonal employee so that we didn't lose the capability of the department and still say the, the, there still was a net positive gain to the community. So I think we can save money, but I th and I think we can also get um, more workforce and, and then really create two new jobs. You're going to lose one for the retirement, you just said, right? Yes. How, what's the headcount compared? You haven't filled all the positions right along, I don't think. We have. Yes. Are you in, in the past four years, we've, we, well, from, I'll, I'll tell you from four years ago, we were at the same number at, today as we were four years ago. I mean, they, there's only been uh, slight delays in filling those positions, but we've maintained the same headcount. So we're going to increase that headcount by two? That's what's proposed. The long term, I believe it's, we're at a negative four or five in the past probably 10 to 15 years. Parks and DPW, according to okay, this isn't the full time period, but peaked at 15. Um, and we were down, we had 13 for quite a while from this whole period from 2010 to 2015, or 2014. So that puts you back up to what the workforce was as late as um, 2009. Hey, Jeff. Um, you mentioned that the bridge tender is, I think, on, on Maple Street Bridge do maintenance? They currently do not, but they would. Okay, what type of maintenance would they be doing? Well, there's a lot of, I mean, we just, in fact, we had a meeting with the bridge tenders today on, on the gearing. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of moving parts in those, um, washing, cleaning, uh, a lot of greasing that gets done, um, and then it needs to be done regularly. Do we have the state inspection, state inspectors come and look at the bridge every once in a while? We're required by the state of Michigan, and there's probably four or five different inspections that get done on the bridge, and they all have different intervals between them. Uh, one's a two-year, you know, one's a ten-year, as an example. Are we ever nicked on those? Um, we have not been nicked, if you will. But when there's, uh, I'll give an example, there was a, a, a structural analysis that was done last year, um, part of a routine uh, inspection. And what the state is, is, what MDOT has set up after some of the, the critical bridge failures across the nation is, 
um, when they see some deterioration or something, then it gets on the radar screen. Then you've got to put it in your capital improvement program to uh, to plan for those replacements. Um, so we're, we're, we're we don't have anything that falls into that critical category right now, but we're starting to look out in the five to six year and uh, possibly you know applying for some grant funds, some bridge funds to to do some of those upgrades, painting, spot welding, those kind of things. Okay. Thank you. For the seasonal employee, is he would that person be part of the union at that time or? <coughs> Well, this, the, the, if, this, if the budget is approved with this component in it, mm -hmm. the first step that we would do is post those three positions internally per our union contract. So uh, there, there's a whole process. If somebody signs for those positions, it would come internally. Those vacant positions would then be posted. And when that's completed, then we would hire new people from, from them with outside on a competitive and interview the, basis. The seasonal economy. But the seasonals are not currently part of the union, but that doesn't preclude them from applying to the future jobs. Right. Well, the reason I ask is, have we ever thought about doing like a, a co-op for like um, college kids or just like what PCA does for in the summertime they, they hire? I would, yeah. respectfully, I would not put college kids working at a bridge. Well, no, I mean, not for kids. For, oh, we I'm do do that. For like parks and stuff. We do that. Yeah, we, we do that in the parks. Um, in the public works, we have currently we have two in the street department and six in the parks department. Um, all of those are are typically well, no, I shouldn't say that. Typically, those are college kids um, that are with us for two to four years. Um, yeah, I should have clarified not with the bridge. Yeah. Any questions? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other areas of the budget that people have questions or concerns about? No, you have not. Um, I'm going to go back to an item from the uh, from the past. The uh, it, because people talked about a contract with AES. The AES contract expires the 31st of December 2017. Uh, it was implemented in 2015 in July uh, and backdated uh, to the 1st of, uh, of January. So those that said would be in violation by reducing funding to AES are, are inaccurate. The contract uh, end date is the 31st of December. Uh, I would like to entertain not budgeting any more than the amount of money necessary to get through the end of the year contract for that. Uh, and should we do an extension of uh, a new contract with, uh, with AES, we can do a supplemental appropriation at that time uh, to cover the cost. I see no reason to budget for something beyond the contract term. How much was the contract? $46,518. They get $1,629.50 the 1st of January, the 1st of April, the 1st of July. Um, and they have a August, 1st of August payment. So the only payments that do under the contract that uh, exist right now is the uh, 1st of July and the 1st of August. Do you know how it's September? Was it September or October? <coughs> October. I would have to disagree with you, Mayor, on that. I continue to fund AES. Um, they're not a perfect organization, but where would we be without them right now? Who's going to take that lead to bring future business to Manistee? But I'll tell you what was in the last contract, in the objectives in the last contract. <coughs> Vote capital campaign. Complete a 700,000 refinance uh, by September 2015. Uh, provide private donations uh, and grants with a goal of $100,000 by March 2016. To this date, the 700,000 refinancing has not taken place, and, and this is uh, a year and a half after that target date. 
another one, attempt to secure $40,000 for developing and implementing a housing strategy for Manistee uh, funded by grants. Uh, the funding by October and November 2015 and complete strategy by April 2016. That didn't happen. I'm not even sure what the housing Grand strategy Dale was. business model was another item that we paid for, we got some of our money back, and, and it was a worthless project, and, and that was implemented and overseen by AES. So I, I understand where you're coming from, but where I'm coming from, I'm thinking there's other alternatives, and we as county PAC payers are contributing toward the $90,000 the county pays AES to begin with. I'm, my contention is that there's no reason for us to pay $46,518 on top of that as the city. I don't, I don't see the value to the city. Meaning no disrespect, Mr. Willow, but can you tell me or give me some examples of what they have done? Look around. Well, they, they okay, I, don't, I don't have all the specifics, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, They worked on the brewery, condos on the river, Edgewater, uh, housing projects. Like I said, it's not a perfect department, but we, we do need marketing for Manistee and Manistee County. Mr. Mayor, if I could just interject. As I said in the previous work session, we wouldn't have the opportunity with the post development and the senior center and the residential component of that without AES. They, they brought that opportunity to the community. Same thing with the Hollander project. Uh, even though it's it's on hold right now, we're still working on that. But they brought that opportunity to the community. Um, you know, both of those are housing components, as well as other things. I also talked about. Uh, I just want to remind council that. We have, we're under an obligation to the DEQ to uh, take care of our remaining CSO, and um, they have used their their contacts to get us in, in uh, a telephone conference call with the top two USDA rural development for the state of Michigan. We couldn't have done that. Not, not get those. So there's a lot of opportunities that they're bringing to us. Are, are you telling me if we don't pay them the bonus money, they're not going to do that? We we are residents of the county of Manistee. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I'm what, just, you know, okay. I was responding to what has what has AAS done for the community. Those are three things just right off the top of my head that uh, I think are pretty impactful for our community. Can I ask a question here? Um, AES, do they do any type of light work on dredging? For our heart. I haven't seen it specifically. I believe they have in the past, though. Yeah, I, since I've been here, I've, I've not seen that. You know, there's, there's, you know, the, the, the uh, Explore the Shores initiative and the things that they were working on with, with the uh, beach. There's just that's what I'm saying is whether I don't know if, whether they would do that or not, whether we contributed or just under the county. I'm just saying. These are the things that they've done for our community. That's one point I was making. I don't personally feel that we're getting enough attention. Um, I, I do see that they've done some things, but I also know paying for it through the county. Uh, I really can relate to Roger's comments that he made a couple weeks ago or a couple meetings ago about that I don't feel the communication from them is very thorough I feel like they're just I, I just don't feel like I'm getting enough um, I don't understand why one of the biggest things that when they surveyed the residents uh, several years ago the biggest thing that people wanted was more jobs and there's got to be a really heavy emphasis on that I can you imagine what 500 jobs would do this community. I mean, that's an astronomical number. Even if they they all were paid twenty five thousand and we're only bringing home twenty, 
that's still a, a big influx of cash that we're talking about. That's millions of dollars. Um, we really need the jobs. I, I think that's one thing that this area, and especially the city, has been complaining about for a while. So although I, I like a lot of the things that they have done for us, I just really f feel like we're missing the objective. And, I, and people that I talk to are disheartened about that. <coughs> So I'm, I guess I see it both ways, but I, I'm feeling like we just aren't getting the kind of service or attention that we need in the areas that we, we've asked for. So I'm not ungrateful for the things that they brought to us, but we just seem to keep missing that one mark on jobs. You talk about it's not, it's hard to quantify exactly what they do. And I agree with that in part. Um, I have no trouble quantifying what they're doing for Bear Lake in the 31 corridor. I, there's some of the areas around us that I have no trouble. There's a lot of information out there about what they do and what they're doing. I see a little about Manistee. I said in a meeting when this was first proposed and budgeted and, and I, I heard all of the rhetoric about how the city of Manistee was going to contribute but we were going to receive a higher level of service. I've heard this repeatedly. And when I tried to figure out what this high, higher level of service is, I have trouble figuring that out because I see everybody getting about the same service. So help me out. I've asked those questions. I've asked them directly to AES. I've talked with Mr. Irving myself from Florida a year or so ago and wanted to know about what is this higher level of service that we're getting that nobody else is getting that we're paying for. I think that's a fair question. I think that's a taxpayer should know that. Um, I, can you tell me? I, I don't know what that is. I'm, I'm just going from the list of items that were included right. as, as, as what was being projected from the last contract that was signed in 2015 with AES in, in items that have not come to bear. In response to the question, there's, there's no way I can tell you we got this because we paid extra or we got that because we paid it. I, I can't, I can't say that. Well, evidently, you're not alone. You're not, I just believe it's a fair question. What, what, if we're going to pay extra, what are we paying extra for and what are we getting uh, compared to, to other areas? That, that's all. And I don't see it. Um, I just don't see it. I just want to go back to the basics. I just want them to really concentrate on bringing more jobs here. I mean. <laughs> well, well, right now, half of the $46,518 could be pulled out of the budget. Um, it's actually payment that would extend beyond the contract period to begin with. Um, and it, money that could be used for something else. So I would suggest that we yeah. do that. So is that suggesting that um, we stop payment to AES entirely, or we do we explore and try to figure out exactly what's going on and try to work with them closer? What What is that suggestion? My suggestion is that in June or July, uh, if we follow the time frame, we'll, we'll be talking about um, a new contract with AES or, or not contracting with AES. The last contract was signed the 7th of July uh, in 2015 for a three-year period of time. But again, it was backed up to the 1st of January of, of that year. It runs the county cycle on, on a calendar year as opposed to a fiscal year. So the actual end of the contract is December 31st, 2017, this year. Bid contract, you have to give six months notice and payments are required through December 31st of the year that you give notice, but we're not mid-year, we're coming up on the end of the contract period and I'm, I'm just saying we can take half that money and put it somewhere else. 
I look at the appropriations, and it's a lot of you know community-driven needs. And I think how painful it is to 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 not fund them. On the same hand, is that really the best use of taxpayer money? But if we had more jobs in the community, there'd be more donations. There'd be more there'd be more dollars that were going through these types of things. So to me, it's still all about jobs. And, and I, I don't know how else to make an impression on AES that that's, and I'm speaking just for myself, I'm sorry, I, I am speaking just for myself. I think that's what their, that should be their number one goal and that's what they should wake up every day and try to solve for us. Because I see jobs going to Ludington, I see jobs going other places, wow, you know? 500 jobs would probably just, we'd be in the gravy boat. We'd almost know what, wouldn't know what to do at that point with that kind of money coming into our community. Well, I have That's no my problem. top priority. I, I, have, I have no problem with, with what Mr. Smith is talking about as far as the ending AES, what, ending that payment at that time. I do have a problem with not continuing negotiations in maybe renegotiating a contract. I think something happened from that time when I sat over there at the meetings at the AES building at their offices and, and they talked about this higher level service and they spelled it out what we were going to get. I just don't see that happening and I think we need to revisit that in the future. If we're gonna to continue to supplement AES, we need to revisit those issues and then make sure that we get the service that we're paying for. I just don't see it right now. I'm, I'm sorry I'm repeating myself, but I remember I, that vividly. I would like to see more communication from AES. Um, you know, some of the points that we, uh, during one of their um, quarterly reviews that, uh, as a council, I think we should know, you know, um, why somebody didn't cho choose choose Manistee? Excuse me there. Um, so we can work on that. We can work with all the with all the entities in in Manistee and Manistee County. Why why somebody didn't want to come here, relocate their business? We need to know that. That's one thing that I've asked uh, for the past couple of years, and we've we've never gotten. Um, so I I would like to see more communication and and uh, spruced up communication. And I think how we do that is that we we we, we can we, we have to, to renegotiate a new agreement. We have to sit down and start renegotiating a new agreement with them if we're going to continue with AES. And we have to spell it out what, what we're going to get for our money. And then we have to make sure that that's, that need is met or what they, they're going to do what they say they're going to do. Um, from what I remember from that meeting, I don't see that happening. All right, I see one way to drive that to, to do precisely what I'm suggesting, and, and that's not fund any additional payment to AES uh, after this year, after this calendar year, because our contract is up the 31st of December. We'll be negotiating a new contract or, or talking about one uh, somewhere in, in the summer time frame. Um, but I, I just assume not have the extra twenty some thousand dollars in the budget that is beyond the contract period to begin with. Yeah, it's it's sort of like we want to leave the door open for the negotiation. Um, but at the same time, I mean we've really taken a strong stand. And I would have to agree, um, with Linda with the jobs. I know that they've added so many housing for us or projects, but how is Manistee going to expand if the housing is going to be low income or um, for only senior citizens? I mean, we need to be able to grow the community, and we wouldn't be able to do that without the jobs. And I don't see AES doing that. And. And it's possible that they are, but we don't get any communication on it. Well, I think so by, that's another problem. I think by, by stopping it and renegotiating, I, I think that um, that, for me, uh, 
kind of leaning that way. You know. I, I don't want to just say goodbye because I believe there is some value there. I just believe that the value is misdirected at this point and we're just not getting, we're not getting what we think we are. Uh, and I'm not even sure I know what we're supposed to be getting, but except a higher level of service, and I, and I don't know what the definition of that is. Well, we wrap this up. How, how many people want to keep the AES funding at $46,518 in the budget? How many would favor budgeting through the end of the year for the contract? Should we be, should we be taking a vote? No. No? Should just, should should just, should just try to reach a consensus. Consensus. Yeah. You can't take any by vote. consensus would be to I I through the end of the year. I will I'm in favor of funding them to the end of the year, but I want to see some negotiation going on. I think that's important too. But that's going to come anyhow. Would like to see Tim Jim Urban here once in a while. He used to come every so often. No, we've never I haven't seen him for a long time. I'm surprised that no one from AES has come to any of the these meetings. Well, there have been. There have been board members. Mm -hmm. There was at the last work session. Uh, there were. And then I mean, like the employees themselves. <coughs> oh, well, by, uh, by the contract, everybody that funds AES is entitled to representation on the board. Eric Gustav was the last <laughs> member uh, who resigned late July. Um, they've never bothered to tell us what the process is. Uh, it's not a city council appointment. Uh, it's not in the uh, city register for uh, who that person is, but the, uh, when Benzie County came online, they got five members on the board. So uh, that was quite an issue at the time, was all the representation that we're getting uh, on, on the AES board. So the consensus is to fund them through the end of the year? That's what I'm hearing. Right. It, so, we we'll make it clear that we are open to negotiate. That we don't want to just say no. Instead of appropriating forty-six thousand five hundred and eighteen dollars, appropriate enough for the last two payments. Where's the uh, Where's the remaining money going to go? There it stays. Can I make a suggestion for that? Right now, the budget with the consensus. Opinions that have been voices that we, we needed to find four thousand dollars. So if you reduce that budgetary allocation by half, just round term, it's twenty three two fifty. I would suggest taking the four thousand out of that, which takes it down to about nineteen thousand. And I would budget a nineteen thousand dollars surplus budget because if you do negotiate with AES at some lesser amount, you need to have that money in there, otherwise yeah. it'll be drawn back. Good right. plan. It's a good plan. Ed. Thank you. So just to, I, I sense we're kind of getting to the end of tonight's session. And just so staff is prepared um, to bring you the right document next Tuesday, just want to go over uh, uh, from the draft budget, my recommended budget presented, you're requesting that you wanted full funding for the uh, alternatives for area youth. So we'll be adding $6,500 in that. And then you also um, wanted an additional $2,500 cut in the Ramsdale. Yes. And then now we're going to be cutting half of AES. Yes. Those are the things that I have noted for changes in the draft budget or the proposed budget. And if that's um, if that's what council understands to be the case, we'll get those modifications ready for next Tuesday for your action. And we were going to come back on the police cars, right? You know, we're going to get something back on those. <coughs> what we're um, going to do is what, what I'm proposing to do is get in there, but we're going to. I'm, I want time for the for the chief to take a look at sure. those and evaluate those. And even though we have them budgeted, there's a chance we might not need all of that. But I don't know that right now. Okay. I, I, but I'd that. also like you to make sure that Quincy is in there and capital approval. Oh, yeah, I can make that change. Yeah, I had that know that that's the thing. Do we have any more work sessions for this? No, none scheduled. Did we have any consensus for the PEG and uh, Manistee Saints? The consensus that was reached at the last was to keep the Manistee Saints at, at the, that their uh, recommended three thousand dollars. The recommended, and then to um, keep the peg with uh, 
the my recommendation of uh, no funding. Okay. That was a consensus. So that's so really the only the only changes that we're going to have again is we'll <coughs> substitute Quincy for to be determined. Mm -hmm. um, we'll restore full funding for the uh, alternates for area youth. We'll take an additional twenty five hundred dollars out of the Ramsdale Ramsdale appropriation, <coughs> and then we'll cut the AES appropriation by half. And those changes will be made and. Uh, ready for your action at Tuesday's meeting. Okay. Other comments? Thank you for all your hard work and all your patience. So, you know, it's an interesting process. I, you know, I wish it started a little bit earlier and, and we had a more leisure schedule to go through the multitude of pages and, and look at the capital improvement and, and coordinate all these things together and and have a, a better dialogue. It, it's hindered somewhat because of <coughs> the need to do everything in open session for a city council and, uh, and not not be able to collaborate anything uh, out, outside of that. But I uh, appreciate the uh, attention that all the council members have given to this. I appreciate the staff's efforts. Uh, I thank everybody for the diverse opinions, uh, but uh, also being cordial in the process. With that, I just add one other thing yep, here. Okay. Um, this Friday is Mark Pateki's last day with the city. He was uh, worked for the city for 41 years and two months. Oh, so oh. I, you know, thank him oh. uh, for his hard work and longevity. Well, one more thing to bring up: uh, Mayor Pro Tem Zelensky and myself have um, been kind of brainstorming and talked to several other people. We would we would like to host a uh, summer picnic for city employees uh, like hosted council. by city council yeah. hosted by city council the um, invite employees and uh, and families to a to a picnic um, and everybody is is welcome to participate and help out financially and work wise um, what do you want how much you want 100 bucks you know that that would work. I'm working with the uh, the Elks Lodge right now. Uh, uh, they got a nice facility with an outdoor patio uh, and such, and, and they would co-host. But uh, would like to do something really nice to recognize the uh, the contributions of the employees of the city of Manistee. Can we Nobody. also can we also do the people that are the boards of commission bring them with it? But the, we, we talked about that earlier. We talked about it years ago, taking and having. I appreciate you dinner or whatever. Yeah, you yeah. Woods and yes, if you, if you know, plenty of commission. He threw that back and forth and talked about it, and it's just a good time to talk about it. We wanted to do something separate, but I, I personally don't see anything wrong with doing it all at once. And that way, council can interact with the board members and, yeah. and boards, commissions, families. all of them. I want to make it very clear that nobody has yeah, to. Yeah, that, 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 would, that would be a lot of people there. What, uh, 50, 56 employees in the city. Um, there's got to be at least that number of board and commission members uh, and families. But If you want to do it separate, we'll do it separate. I think doing it separate might actually be more advantageous so that we can get around it and talk to people. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to throw it out because I could, I could save the dates at, with the Elks and um, I've already lined up some volunteers. So we, uh, we don't want them to bring anything. We just want, we want them to come enjoy themselves. All the food will be supplied. And, Roger will be grilling hamburgers. Hopefully, nobody dies from it. <laughs> Good. So it's in 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 the planning stage. So uh, with that, anything else? We can adjourn. Thank you all.